Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to our Learning from Ethiopia talk series. We're very happy that you could join us. This is our fourth talk of this series, and we are very happy to have Taryn here to talk about the uh, Rock Hewan Church of Ethiopia and hopefully teach us something new. Uh, we also have here Biniam, the chair of the Intabal Ethiopian chapter. We have uh, Juliet, the main programs uh, coordinator for Intabal in general. And everybody else, welcome. Uh, feel free to type in, in the chat where you're from, any questions you have, just let us know. It's also good for us to see who's there and who of any of your opinions, we're very happy to hear that. Uh, I think I will pass it on to Biniam now to introduce Turn and tell you a little bit about Intabout and what we stand for. So Biniam, over to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Mina. Um, Intabout Ethiopia is um, the newly established, I think uh, probably the latest uh, addition to the Intabout network. And um, within our chapter and in in general, we uh, seek to promote uh, traditional building, urbanism, uh, traditional uh, building, architecture, and urbanism, and local building practices. And there are multiple ways in which we try to do that. And uh, this talk series uh, of the Ethiopian chapter is one way uh, of. Uh, initiating a discussion in and around uh, local building cultures, of course, focusing on Ethiopia. And the series has been uh, running uh, for some months now. We are already today on the fourth talk. Uh, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, our today's speaker uh, would be Tarn, of course. I'll introduce him shortly. Uh, but before that, uh, I want to remind everyone that if you want to uh, become a member, uh, Mina will be um, sharing the link and you can do so by filling this simple form. Uh, you will have it in the chat box uh, quite soon, I hope. Uh, and then, of course, uh, while yes. Arne is speaking, uh, feel free to type your questions or reflections in the chat. And yeah, uh, I think Mina, other than the membership link, should be also sharing our social media links, which you can follow for um, to find out about more what we do. Um, yeah, so that's about it. And um, about our to today's speaker, um, Tarn, um, Tarn Philip. Yeah, he's a South African born, London based architect and independent researcher. He has visited uh, Ethiopia since in 2014 and he's uh, been returning since then to undertake uh, research. Uh, Adam Architecture Travel Scholarship, which he received in 2015, and the Arcadia Fund Research Project from 2016 until 2020. He's also a recipient of the Venus, Venus Biennale Research Fellowship in, of 2018 and the AJ Small Projects um, Sustainable Project Award in 2020. Uh, prior to this talk, he has presented his research on numerous occasions, including International Conference of Ethiopian Studies uh, in 2018, Art Works Guide in 2016, and the London Festival of Architecture in 2019 and Anglo-Ethiopian Society in 2019, yeah. Uh, in today's talk, uh, he will share his findings from uh, his fieldwork uh, research from 2015 until 2020 to offer us some insight into the craft of uh, new rock Hill churches uh, and explore whether this resurgence uh, represents a revival or a continuation of uh, the stone carving or rock on church that uh, existed uh, that exists in the northern uh, country in the northern part of the country in Ethiopia um, so uh, over to you Tar thank you thank you Benio. Um thanks for the introduction and Thank you um, to, to all of you for the invitation um, and Inval as well for um, sort of allowing us to have this platform. 
And it's very nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Sorry we can't all be in the same room, but... Um, um, all right, so, um, yeah, I think William's already give, given quite a big background. Um, as you mentioned, I sort of uh, first traveled to Ethiopia in 2014 and returned in 2015 with the um, uh, sort of a modest scholarship from Adam Architecture. And since then, I've been working with um, a professor from Toronto University, Michael Jervis, who I think is here. And we've been looking specifically at new rock hewn churches, um, which are being carved. And so I thought I'd start with this quote, which is by a British architect who actually traveled um, to the region um, in the late 60s and early 70s um, and, and recorded a lot of churches um, in Tigray, in northern Ethiopia, where there's over 120 um, rocking churches. I guess, um, yeah, and not everyone, uh, I, I don't know if everyone's aware of the sort of current political situation in Ethiopia, particularly Tigray, but this sort of quote is quite pertinent. Um, yeah, during uh, just sort of she she was there till uh, 1974 and then there was the rise of the Derg, um, which effectively meant that travel in Ethiopia was very difficult um, and yeah she, she wasn't actually able to return so I think yeah a, part of, a lot a big part of the motivation to to sort of go to Ethiopia was was the sort of the fact that um, there's sort of the possibility of um, unknown or unrecorded rocking churches um, and the possibility that um, new ones are being carved as well. Um, so yeah, um, in 2015, it was a, sort of a modest uh, scholarship, traveled on local transport. Um, I spent six weeks in Ethiopia and was able to, to, to visit sort of 24, 25 sites um, and produce measured drawings as well. Um, and I guess it was during this time that I, I sort of realized that new rock churches are actually being carved and that's my, um, sort of began working with um, Michael Jervis from Toronto University. So I apologize for those of you that um, are maybe more familiar with um, Ethiopian Christian history, but I thought it'd be useful to, to give sort of an overview um, before talking more specifically about Ethiopian churches and then finally New Rockland churches, um, which is sort of uh, what, we, what I'm really interested in. Um, so this is a quote by um, uh, Francisco Alvarez, who was a Portuguese explorer, who was the first foreigner to um, at least describe seeing the churches at Lalibela, which um, I imagine most of you are familiar with, but there's basically 11, uh, a complex of 11 churches which are carved, uh, sunk into the rock. And the reason I put this quote up here is because I think for many people that have, have sort of um, uh, traveled to Lalibela since I think a lot of what he's sort of said really rings true. It's, it's absolutely um, remarkable and awe inspiring um, space. So it's important to note that while the churches at Lalibela are cut downward into the rock, as the image on the left, um, the churches in Tigray in the north are actually carved horizontally into the rock. So there's effectively two sort of uh, primary types of rock in church. And I guess owing to the, the fact that these churches are carved from a single material um, with, with, within the rock or, or mountain, they take on highly sculptural um, qualities. So for anyone traveling to Ethiopia today, I think one of the first things you'll realize depending when you visit is that it's a lot um, greener than you might have imagined. Another thing that you will sort of soon realize is that um, Christianity is alive and well and um, very much embedded in, in sort of everyday life. Um, and I've put a little question mark there of the date at the top. Um, yeah, basically the Ethiopian calendar is derived from the, uh, one of the, the Coptic Egyptians um, and is effectively seven years behind the Gregorian calendar. Um, and I, I think that's just sort of the reason I put that there is just to kind of reiterate the, um, the, the sort of age old relationship that Ethiopia has with the ancient world, and particularly sort of Egypt and Israel. Um, so going back, um, so sort of 1000 BC, so 3000 years ago, a group of um, uh, settlers referred to as the Sabians sort of migrated from Arabia and settled um, on the east coast of Africa near modern day Aksum. Um, and while they, they brought sort of, or possibly brought um, some, some of their sort of own building traditions with them, what's really interesting is that the subsequent civilization that emerged in Aksum um, really represents, uh, or seems to represent, uh, uh, a real coming together of indigenous and um, foreign culture. And this is expressed uh, both in the language of Gez, 
um, which, which emerged, but particularly in the architecture as well. So the, the image at the top right is um, the Temple of Yia, which is um, close to Uxum, that dates from this, uh, 700 BC. Um, so, yeah, over two and a half thousand years old. And it shows a, sort of similar, quite clear similarities to a lot of temples throughout the Middle East. Um, what's interesting is um, with the rise of Uxum, so um, sort of around 2000 years ago, you, you begin to uh, get a, a new sort of um, vernacular form of construction, which is not found um, outside the region. And some of the better examples of these are um, these large sort of square palaces, um, which are still ruins in, in Aksum today. Um, and then this um, sort of very particularly, particular um, form of construction, which developed. And I guess just while we're on the map, um, yeah, I guess it's just very important to highlight the relationship that Ethiopia has with the Red Sea, um, which meant, you know, sort of, from the earliest of times, it was very much um, uh, in contact with the merchants, whether, whether those were um, uh, Greek, Roman, um, Indian, etc. It was very much in, in, uh, connected with the, the wider ancient world, um, and of course with Egypt and Israel uh, to the north. So if you go to Aksum today, this is the um, one of the palaces uh, near Aksum, and I guess what's what's interesting is that the palace is sort of the is could be seen as a, combi a combination of these two kind of cultures. So you've got uh, the steps of pediment um, at the entrance of the palace, but then this um, uh, sort of Aksumite um, construction. Sorry, maybe just to explain on on the bottom that Aksumite construction is effectively. Um, uh, so the horizontal bands of, of small stones tied, bonded together with mortar with horizontal um, timbers running the length of the wall. And then above that, there's cross members which protrude to form what are, what are called uh, monkey heads um, above. And to sort of deal with openings, it's sort of the incohesive nature of, of these stone walls, the subsumite uh, sort of frame detail emerged, which again has protruding um, elements at the corners. And so again, another, um, another sort of key <laughs> um, uh, sort of surviving memory of, of the Aksumite civilization and the, of the stelae, which are, are sort of quite well known. I guess what's interesting about these is that they um, they basically immortalize in rock the built construction of the time. So if we look again at this Aksumite detail with this, these protruding um, border elements, you, you realize that effectively this, this is almost a, a, a monument to Aksumite um, architecture or, or construction. Um, and these are pre-Christians at the top. You can see there's the, um, the crescent. Um, so yeah, um, the Aksumite Empire um, well, sort of grew to prominence uh, and in 341 AD, it adopted Christianity. Um, it was the second state to do so after Romania. And there's evidence, evidence of a sort of specific date is, is found on coins which are found in Aksum during the reign of uh, uh, Empress uh, King King Azana, and the, the coin, coins of at the beginning of his reign uh, sort of uh, depict pagan symbols, and and then after his conversion, uh, uh, the cross. Um, so sort of moving on from that in the fifth and sixth centuries, that's really when Christianity um, cemented itself in the region, and that was through the arrival of nine saints, thought to be uh, mostly from um, uh, sort of Greater Syria um, and possibly coming through Egypt. And they sort of uh, founded monasteries both in and around Aksum. And what's interesting is that the, the sort of Aksumite form of construction continues to be used in um, these built churches. This is Deborah Dunmore, which is from the sixth century, um, one, one of a few surviving built examples. Um, so, so, sort of around the seventh century, with the, the um, rise of Islam, the Arabs effectively took control of. Um, the, the Red Sea and the Aksumite Empire sort of became cut off on the, um, uh, I guess, sort of the trade that it depended on. And it's sort of during this time, so, so this is a map on the left showing Christian Ethiopia, sort of um, in the 14th century. And what's, what's important to note is, is just how sort of isolated it is um, from the rest of the Christian world, effectively. So, sort of from, from um, this point onwards, you start to find a lot of um, churches in, in some very um, uh, isolated places and um, possibly then the sort of establishment of the first rock in churches. Um, 
So this is a little bit later, but this image on the left is from the 12th, uh, 12th century church um, uh, in Amhara uh, called Yomarana Christos, not far from Malibella. And what's interesting to know is that it's the same construction. Um, so this is uh, more than a thousand years after the Epsilon Stella, but it's the same construction. In this case, the um, small stones have been plastered over. Um, and what's interesting at, at La Libella is, again, um, so that's thought to be carved around the 13th century, at least um, uh, according to sort of oral tradition. It, it again is um, immortalizing this, this form of construction. So you've got a continued um, form of construction for sort of over a thousand years at least. So I'll speak a little bit more just about um, churches. I've, I, I guess I've mentioned some of the influence, but the image on the left is um, really highlighting the, the influence of, of Syria. Um, so this was uh, through sort of, um, sorry, uh, through sort of the nine saints who, who arrived there, but, but also the um, adaption of the Syrian basilica in, in early churches. Um, and there's also, uh, I guess, with that, uh, a strong influence from Egypt. There's also a strong influence from uh, Greece, um, and that's actually pre Christian, so there, there was worship in Aksum um, of sort of uh, Greek gods. And the image on the right, I think, is probably well, among one of the most important. So, this is the Star of David. And just to highlight that the Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is, is sort of very much rooted in, um, in the Old Testament. Um, I, I won't go into the story of Queen Sheba, but, um, or maybe, maybe I should just mention it. <laughs> People don't know, but um, yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, the important link is, is, is Queen Sheba. This is sort of during the time of Solomon, so almost 3,000 years ago. Ethiopian um, oral tradition sort of asserts that she traveled to Jerusalem to meet Solomon, and, and um, on return to Ethiopia, she, she bore a son uh, who was then became King Menelik, and he later traveled to Jerusalem to, um, to, to visit his father. Uh, Solomon and returned back to Ethiopia with um, the Ark of the Covenant. And Ethiopians believe that this is kept in Aksum and uh, Marantion. Um, yeah, and it's it's a yeah, very um, important part of uh, sort of Ethiopian orthodoxy. Um, so again, continuing on from that, this is Solomon's Temple on the top left, and then the early sort of rectangular basilica built church on the, on the on the top right, and then. So later on, it seems um, possibly around the 17th century, there's formation of a, a circular built church um, and then a rectangular church sort of parallel to that. So they, yeah, basically every Ethiopian church includes um, these three key religious spaces. So the first is the Kenamalet, um, which is sort of the entrance uh, or, or uh, the ante room to the church, and that corresponds to um, the Ulam in uh, Solomon's temple. The second space is the uh, kadist or the body of the church, and then the third, the third part is the uh, maktas or, or sanctuary. And again, you can see every church includes these spaces, and it's it's all, almost always orientated towards the east as well. And then just to note, within this, uh, so within the maktas, the sanctuary, there's a, a mambara tabot, which is an altar, and in or on that you have the tabot, which is a replica of the uh, of the um, the tablet, so of the Ark of the Covenant, and that's within every church. And I guess just to note that it's the it's the tabot which is consecrated, not the church. So if the tabot was to be moved from that church, it would sort of effectively lose its sanctity in, in, in some way. So I guess moving on from built churches, this is the example I, I showed earlier. But um, the reason this church survives is largely due to the fact that it's located within a large cave, and so this is dating from the 12th century. A sort of possible progression from this is a built church within a cave, but in this case, the rear of the cave and the, the um, sort of roof of the head has been carved as well. So, so on the left, you've got the, um, the built nave at, at the first church at Yumiani Christos, and on the right, um, built um, sort of columns below, but the, 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 the um, sorry, the roof of the nave is actually carved from the, uh, the mouth of the cave. Um, and, and moving on from that, you then sort of get a, a completely rocking church. In this case, it, it seems that the, the front of the church has possibly fallen away and been, been built up, but it's effectively within, within the rock. Um, so, so just to kind of reiterate the location of these 
church is sort of is is quite amazing in itself and um, so often very isolated this is other salama so this is um yeah basically fermentus so the, the person who's sort of attributed with introducing christianity um and this this is the monastery and this purple band of rock along here is basically where you've, you've got to walk along this ledge and then there's a kind of a crevice which is about 20 meters high which you, you need to then sort of ascend so it's it's really it's quite difficult to get to some of these places um um, of course, people who yeah sort of have grown up there, it's no problem. Um, so I guess yeah, um, rock churches largely due to the fact that they carve within um, uh, sort of within the natural landscape and possibly um, intentionally trying to sort of conceal themselves from um, it's possibly a Muslim threat. They do tend to um, almost omit a facade, so have very few openings. Um, there are some examples which um, sort of include a frontage structure as the middle one on the right, and then there are of course churches which which um, have, have a sort of more expressed facade. Um, and I think the fact that there are relatively few openings really kind of adds to the whole heightens the experience of entering these spaces, which are then um, often richly carved and um, uh, with, with really beautiful paintings as well. Um, so yeah, again, just to, to reiterate, there's, there can be a lot of architectural details. These again, one to the left, sort of blind arcading could, could be seen to derive from the the um, sort of the, the apex of the Axum uh, Stella. From the right, just highlights sort of the variety of roof structures that um, appear, and so it's sort of a, the underside of a boat on the top right, and then uh, domes or cupolas at the bottom bottom right, and just to yeah, maybe highlight that these are often not structural, so it's sort of purely um, artistic or decorative. Okay, so this is a yeah another example of a, an older rocking church, thought to date from um, sort of around the 10th century. And I guess what's uh, important to note with this is that it's, it's all effectively a square basilica plan. But in this case, this uh, sanctuary has been carved to, to the east, the central uh, Marktas. Um and then you've also got this colonnade on, on the left, which is, is sort of uh, Slightly peculiar and interesting. So again, just to, to give you an idea of the interior of the space, um, the, the, the raised nave with um, sort of the carved ceiling and what's known as an axomite frieze uh, running along. And also, yeah, just to sort of highlight the combination of um, different roof structures found within this same church. You know, so the fact that it's not built means that there can be a variety of uh, sort of almost an earlier adaptation or sort of borrowing. Uh, different forms of construction and kind of immortalizing them uh, within one rock or within one space. So yeah, these are just um, some elevation drawings, the one on the left um, sort of showing it before, before oh, sorry, the one on the left showing it with the portico as it is now and the, the one on the right with, without the sort of built portico which appears to have been added later on. And I think um, while the plans are very useful, I think section drawings are probably the, you know really helpful in explaining these churches in relation to um, yeah <laughs> explaining how these churches sort of sit within the rock face of the landscape. Again, this is another church. This is the Church of Maria Bahara, um, and it's located at the bottom of a large cliff. And in this case, is a large frontage a frontage structure which has been built uh, later, which has effectively doubled um, the size of the church. And in this case, as a, uh, many others, the paintings have been whitewashed over, um, possibly due to a fire at some point. Um, and then in 2015, I was actually able to visit this church um, while there were um, two British uh, wall painting conservationists busy uncovering the paintings. Um, and the, the uh, Tavot was temporarily moved to another church, which meant I sort of had free access um, uh, and unlimited time to, to sort of spend in the church. And again, these are section drawings just highlighting the relationship of this church at the foot, foot of this uh, large cliff. Um, so yeah, um, maybe just worth uh, <laughs> mentioning. It, it, so according to uh, Ethiopian oral tradition, um, most rock churches date from sort of the fourth century, um, often uh, sort of attributed to kings or, or, or sort of saints. Um, this is sort of looking at a possible architectural progression. Um, so not, not necessarily based on dates, but looking at, um, I, I guess, from the, from the top left, it's sort of a square basilica, which is, is quite similar to some of the earlier built churches, as well as the Aksumite um, palace. 
Um, you then sort of have the introduction of the, of the central mucus to the east, possible sort of um, in the chain, lateral chambers um, to, to the left or right. Um, you then get churches with sort of um, uh, more than one uh, sanctuary. And, and finally, sort of number uh, the sixth uh, image here, you've, you've got an ambulatory passage, the tunnel effectively carved around the church to allow access from, from sort of, uh, the west, the north, and the south. Um, and then there's a, a further progression of this um, with an ambulatory passage, but in this case, the, um, the rock overhead has been removed. So it's effectively a trench um, sort of, uh, circumnavigating the church. And finally, you then get um, what we'll refer to as the Tigray Cross and uh, Square churches, um, which sort of have a, a large courtyard to the west of the church, which partially exposes the north and uh, south elevation. Um, I, I guess you, know, you, you can see there's quite a variety of them, quite a variety of church plans have emerged, and I think this is yes something that's uh, kind of common in Ethiopian Moroccan architecture. It sort of adapts to to um, the, the way the church might be orientated within the rock, as well as to where, you know, in some cases, you might come across a piece of granite and, and have to sort of change the course of, of, of the work. Um, and finally, you then get um, uh, these sort of monolithic churches, which are, are sort of more known, um, and Laliwela, which are cut completely downward into the rock and, and sort of fully exposed. So, um, We'll now move on to sort of new rocking churches. Um, so as I, as I noted, in 2015, I visited this um, site, which is sort of about two and a half meters tall, and um, the entrance is on the left. And I sort of thought this is an, an interesting space. So it was, it was under excavation. Um, and it was, it was sort of only, um, yeah, after the, the craftsman sort of explained to me what was actually going on, is that I realized what sort of looks like seats at the rear of the wall is actually the top of capitals, and the, the columns are yet to be carved below. I think also maybe important to note is sort of the use of strings, so quite sort of basic um, forms of construction, uh, you know, string with a stick used to mark out the dome overhead. Um, and again, here you can see these columns, which have been sort of been worked from top to bottom. Um, uh, yeah, still rough. At the bottom. Um, so, as Benjamin mentioned, I returned to Ethiopia in 2016, or well, I've been returning since 2016, working with Michael Jervis on an Arcadia funded project, or, um, also with Toronto University, and this has been part of a, a much larger team. Um, so, and, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this possibly later, but um, yeah, I guess the aim of the project is, is really to document the craft of. Um, New rock in churches, so both through photography, architectural drawings, and so, so far we've we've measured over forty sites, um, but also to sort of record the craft through video inter interviews, and um, both with the craftsman and priests responsible. So in some ways, this this work's almost taken on a sort of an anthropological like nature. And so, if anyone's interested, this is the um, the, the sort of online database with Toronto University, which you can. You can access and you'll then have um, sort of all the sites arranged on the sites in, in the three key regions and then sort of uh, uh, sub regions or districts and, and then a series of churches that are found within that area. And again, on each of the sites, there's sort of a brief site description within the videos, any relevant videos in this case, um, and with, with the craftsmen, with the priest, and with a non responsible for raising money for the church. Um, as well as photos and then drawings. So that's just to give you give you a sort of a sense of what's there, and, and that's all you know, sort of all open open resource, freely accessible. Um, I guess yeah, important to note that the researchers sort of identified three key areas. Um, so in Tigray in the north, Shawa uh, and um, North Walla, both in Amhara region. Um, but there seems to be these sort of three main clusters of um, of New York churches, and. Yeah, it's, it's worth adding that um, this seems to have you know, sort of <laughs> the phenomenon of new rock churches really seems to have happened within the last 30 years. So that there's no kind of evidence to suggest that, that, that churches were being carved before that. So uh, the, the sort of common understanding is that they were sort of carved possibly until the 15th century. And it seems that within the last 30 years, there's sort of a revival. And a big part of this um, research was to try and establish whether, or, whether the 
this is the case or whether there was sort of a, a continued unbroken tradition. Um, but of course, given that often people in the areas are, you know, are sort of unaware that there might be a rock in church being carved, it's quite hard to locate. So you can see what looks like a landslide. There's actually the excavation of a church underway. Um, and yeah, I guess um, similar to sort of how I started, but just to reiterate, um, that's that church in the background, that what looks like white's uh, sort of a landslide. That's where a new church has been carved. And I guess just to highlight um, that this forms sort of a backdrop to everyday life in, in sort of um, rural Ethiopia. Um, so yeah, um, new new rocking churches can be, I guess, defined in two um, main categories. Uh, the, the, fir the first um, is sort of an expansion of an existing old church or, or replacement of a built structure. Um, and the second is, is an entirely new church. I guess it's more important to note that all churches will include a, a source of holy water. So in many ways, um, the sites that have been in use, um, you know, sort of for some time, they're, they're not entirely new. Um, Sorry, I've got some notes for this, so I'll try and mm. So I guess, yeah, going on to, to discuss um, sort of the embodied knowledge um, related to these structures. Um, if embodied knowledge is neither preserved in written or oral form, how else might it survive but through physical manifestation, that is through the architecture itself? Ancestral achievements serve as a vocation for current craftsmen. This indirect intergenerational dialogue presents an unusual form of embodied knowledge and transfer of skill. So the resurgent uh, present day craftsmen are self taught, necessitating the relearning and possible reappropriation of the forgotten craft. However, the use of primitive handheld tools suggests a method likely employed in medieval and ancient churches. Of particular interest is the apparent resurgence of the craft across Christian Ethiopia. From Tigray in the, in the north to Amhara and Aronia in the south. Responsible craftsmen and priests are usually unaware of the practice locally, let alone in another linguistically differentiated region. The simultaneous resurgence of the craft in apparent isolation supports that the craft may indeed represent intermittent practice rather than a total revival. Okadia funded research has fortunately yielded a significant number of active craftsmen. Those in Amhara region tend to be solely driven by religious vocation, often choosing to distance themselves from society and caste single handedly. Typically, as work progresses, support from the community grows and contributions are made in the form of provisions. In, con in contrast, craftsmen in Tigray are often employed in con on a contract like basis by a representative of the church or local community. This, in turn, has led to the emergence of master craftsmen or individuals who have worked in several churches. The process of creating a rocking church has long been assumed as top to bottom excavation. The initial point of entry later forms an upper window as the craftsmen continue to carve the church below. At the freestanding courtyard churches of Lalibela, both the exterior and the interior are thought to have been carved simultaneously in this manner. While the majority of newly identified sites do employ this method, the opposite has also been recorded. At Mariam Shuitor in Tigray, having broken into the rock by means of an entrance, the excavated slag forms a platform from which the craftsmen continue to carve overhead. On achieving the desired height and having completed any carved patterns to the ceiling, upper walls and column shafts, the slag is then removed to, re to expose the church in its entirety. So again, these are just um, some photos of, of churches sort of under excavation. And this is just, yeah, so I guess just to highlight this, there's sort of two forms of of uh, carving a church. The one on the left is top to bottom and on the right is uh, bottom to top. So you can sort of get an idea of... <laughs> the way this works. So I think I've probably uh, dwelled on this, but it's important to know that the inspiration of New Rock churches, as suggested by their function, is largely, is largely due to religious motive. While the contracted craftsmen of Tigray are financially driven, they, as the village communities that fund their work, are devout Christians. 
And this is um, uh, the same day of uh, Abra Watspa um, or, or Azana in, uh, uh, in uh, Tigray in 2014. And this is uh, more recently, this was in, um, this is Timkat um, in uh, Abiyadi in Tambien, uh, which and this was in January, February last year, so it's more so recent. Um, So while um, most new churches in Tigray borrow their form from the Basilica, churches in Amhara do not. These southerly churches tend to lack a level of sophistication and attention to detail, evident in old, old rocky churches. Exceptions are the church at Atissa, Meskaba Kudusan, Bethany Alem, near Saladingo, and the ambitious Dagmawi Lalibela church complex near Bishena. The, ch the church plan at Atissa is noteworthy as it is the only rock church to reflect the relatively recent Ethiopian rectangular built church, a development of the basilica that places the Maktas centrally rather than at the far east. So, this is a site um, near Goshena uh, in Amara. Um, and yeah, so it's called Dogmawi Lalibela. So in addition to a religious motive, the Dagmari Ladibala complex demonstrates a strong political and social agenda. The principal craftsman, Gabriel Mascal Tosema, describes the project as a reaction to views that question the authenticity of the churches at Ladibala, suggesting that foreigners were responsible for their creation. By understanding the immense task of carving 10 churches using primitive tools and techniques, he hopes to demonstrate that Ethiopians were and are capable of carving such structures. The Dagmawi Lalibela complex strives to restore a sense of pride and traditionalism in the Ethiopian way of life and to educate and remind Ethiopians of the importance of their heritage, something rapidly being lost to Western influence. The abundant relief carvings continue this argument and form a narrative of the past and present and past and present achievements of Ethiopia. So the Dagmawi Lali complex. Uh, presently consists of five subterranean churches, which are connected by open courtyards, short passageways and trenches, so quite comparable to nearby Lalibela. The site demonstrates um, a high level of craftsmanship, seldom realized in newly carved churches. The variety and unusual arrangement of spaces reflect a willingness for experimentation, and the church ceilings and courtyard walls are richly decorated in hieroglyph-like carved relief. Primitive metal tools are sharpened over a fire using bellows. The precision of the ceiling dome is achieved by fixing a piece of wood centrally in the rock. A piece of string is attached to the wooden spoke and used to mark out the circular dome. This method was quite possibly employed in older churches adorned with domes and cupolas. The excavation of rock and intricate relief carvings is done without artificial light, no drawings are used. So this is just to give you um, an idea of the space. So the top left is that image I showed you earlier, which was from 2015, and the image on, on the right is from 2017. So you can see it's the same space which has been excavated. And again, with these sort of very elaborate decorative carvings um, on the ceiling and upper walls. Um, so yeah, the, the level of craftsmanship evident at Dagmawi Lalibela, and indeed the phenomenon of newly carved churches throughout Ethiopia, reflects the level of craftsmanship alluded to by Richard Sennett. Every, every good craftsman conducts dialogue between concrete practices and thinking. This dialogue evolves into sustaining habits, and these habits establish a rhythm between problem solving and problem finding. So I'm going to quickly talk you through the sort of the um, uh, Dagmawi Laluela complex. You can see there's this, sort of these five churches, there's a lot of section drawings. Um, so it's a, yeah, quite it's the largest sort of complex of churches, of new rock churches. And so these are two long sections, um, the top 2015 and then 2017. And you can see sort of the ongoing excavation to the right of the, of the, of the image. And these are sort of sections from 2015. So, and just to show you the relationship of these courtyard spaces and churches within the um, natural rock. And then these images, uh, well, this, this and the subsequent images are uh, showing on the left 2015 and then 2017, so sort of comparing survey drawings. You can sort of see the ongoing excavation. Um, so 
So yeah, th th this is um, uh, from the more recent trip in, in sort of February 2020. Um, and you can see the, the top of these structures have been covered over to protect them um, temporarily from the, the rain. And again, just um, so, so the more complete um, spaces. So I think, yeah, I, I might just talk through a few um, of, of, of these sort of sites. So this is um, uh, Marim Shuito, um, which I sort of showed you briefly earlier in, in Tigray. It's the um, largest site in Tigray that we've identified, um, still under excavation due to a lack of funds. Um, but yeah, you can see in this, in this church, so this is the one where they, they carved um, top downwards. So you can see on the right image, there's sort of all this slag, which the craftsmen are using to, to stand on it and sort of carve overhead. Um, and again, you know, just, just to sort of highlight the use of charcoal to sort of mark out um, decorative features like, uh, sort, of, sort of as crosses. And this is another church, um, Medanyu Lem, um, uh, in, in Tambien. Um, and on the right is, is an old church, which was very small and uh, basically could no longer serve the community. Um, due to its size. So on the left is a new, new rock church which has been carved. And this was in 2016, uh, so it's sort of a view down the nave. And then 2019, when it's, it's sort of complete and it's actually got the Unbarrowed box, so the, the altar has been placed in there. And it's just waiting to be consecrated. And this is another church just outside Hausain, which um, we've been visiting since 2015 um, every year. It's <laughs> um, the, 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 yeah, so this is funded by, by sort of the local community and um, I guess it's, it, they've, they've really sort of struggled to, to have a, a stable income. So um, some churches are carved, carved in as quick as a year. This is, this is really sort of been drawn out due to the lack of funds. Um, but on our last visit, um, we sort of arrived to find craftsmen uh, working. Um, and this is uh, another church which was uh, sort of only recorded in 2019. It's close to Abigrat, which makes it the uh, out of the new rock churches. It's the furthest north that we've identified, so closer toward uh, modern day Eritrea. Um, and again, uh, just a few of the entrance. And here again, you can see the craftsmen um, are, are working sort of top, uh, sorry, bottom up. And you can see them sort of working away at this rock and the sort of carving these grooves uh, to, to sort of chisel out a larger block of rock which then on fall falling sort of breaks into smaller pieces and then can quite easily be um, removed and this is a view in 2019 and uh, sort of about a year later you can see they've sort of removed all the all the slag or sort of, sort of um, stone and that's sort of how it was about a year ago this is uh, uh, another site in uh, so near, to, well, in Gishana, near, near to the other complex I showed you. Um, and this, this craftsman is responsible for uh, four other churches so far. Um, so that just really gives you a sense of, of these sort of spaces. Um, yeah, often really beautiful qualities of, of sort of natural light and, and the stone itself. So the entrance. And this is another church, and this is uh, further south, so closer to Saladingo. And um, I guess there's a couple of things that's, that are interesting about this church. Um, firstly, it's, it's funded by a patron from Addis. Um, so it's maybe worth reiterating, in, in Amhara, most craftsmen tend to be um, uh, sort of hermits, um, you know, choose to distance themselves from um, sort of the community, go live, live in the mountains, and, and sort of have some sort of vision that they should come to church. And in Tigray, it seems to be uh, more sort of a, of a um, it's more sort of a con contractual relationship. So um, the community sort of decides that they need a new, need a new church. There's then a discussion whether this should be built or rock. And the community then gets together and, and raises money. And there's sort of four or five laborers kind of working every day as long as there's sort of a, a steady flow of, of money. In this case, it's sort of the vision of a patron in Addis, and he's sort of he's funding the whole church by himself, but he's not actually carving at all. Um, but this, at least from what we've seen, it, it will be the largest church once once it's complete. So at the moment, it's sort of a tunnel which is 
30 meters deep. Um, and the, the plan is for it to be um, 60, 60 meters in the other direction. Um, so yeah, I think I, I was going to say a little bit <laughs> about documentation. Uh, I don't know if I'll, yeah, I guess maybe, maybe I'll I'm just sort of moving towards close now, but um, I guess undertaking research in Ethiopia involves a level of bureaucracy, negotiation, and patience. So the physical and isolated location, aggravated by impassable, impassable roads in the rainy season and long journeys by foot, make reaching many churches a task in itself. Having obtained relevant paperwork and located a church, access may simply be denied on religious grounds. The irregular spaces of old and new rock churches alike make survey work far more complex than that of a regular built structure. Time and movement in an inactive church is, is often restricted, and spaces such as the maktas or sanctuary rarely observed. So documentation of newly carved churches has the added, added complications of being virtually unknown and under excavation. People living in the surrounding areas are often unaware of the activity, and thus discovering new sites forms a large part of an ex any expedition. That many churches are in a state of ongoing transformation, that the craftsmen use no architectural drawings and often believe they are fulfilling God's work, typically makes future development spontaneous and unpredictable. So in, um, in all the churches that have undergone recent expansion, um, it is necessary to verify the accuracy of any existing drawings. Further investigation and study of older rock new churches, previously recorded by the likes of Ruth Plant, may highlight a significant number of churches that have been subject to alteration in the past 45 years. This in turn may indicate whether the present craft represents revival or continuity. And so yeah, I've, I've added this, this, <laughs> this quote by Galileo Galilei. And um, yeah, I guess, I think it's, it's, it's probably quite a sort of Western approach, the, the sort of idea of documenting and recording or feeling like we have to record everything, which is, is, is definitely a big part of what's happened with the project. So, you know, sort of doing measured survey of, of, of churches, whereas non-Western uh, culture is, is, is often sort of um, more happy to just sort of accept oral traditions as a sort of a way of um, recalling things. Um, I think both, both have their value. And I think in this project, um, while these sort of, the more sort of uh, measurable aspects of sort of those, those drawings and that sort of thing ha has been pretty useful. I think the um, the sort of anthropological almost approach, uh, sort of going back and you know sort of seeing the same craftsman over a period of sort of five six years has been really really informative in, in sort of understanding um, the whole process. Um, so yeah, this this is an image uh, I think from twenty twenty as well in, in Tambien. So I think sort of uh, yeah, visited the church, um, being offered traditional um, beers, it's a swa or tala, um, with sort of very uh, basic in general, as an you know, It's very, very sort of customary to kind of share a meal at sort of almost every church you, you visit. Um, so I think to conclude, the, pr the present craft demonstrates how in the absence of written or oral record, architect architecture itself has the ability to embody knowledge. Old rock churches serve as inspiration for new ones. A sheer existence warrants the creation of a new church possible and provokes inquiry as to how this might be achieved. Without such precedent or religi religious fervor, it is quite inconceivable that clergymen and craftsmen of 21st century Ethiopia might choose to hand chisel churches from solid rock. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Taryn, for that presentation. <laughs> That was very interesting, I think. And I'm sure some of our audiences have expressed how interesting they found it. Uh, so I think I'm going to start with my question first. Uh, sure. You said that there were uh, two types of carvings that were used uh, from top to bottom and from bottom to top. Yeah. What's that, the difference between the two things? What's the difference between them? So effectively, um, if you sort of imagine the cliff face, I guess what's been what sort of historian, historians or sort of experts on, on um, older rocky churches have always sort of imagined that it was top to bottom excavation, which 
in La Libella definitely makes sense. And, and the reason there are these sort of tunnels and, and interconnected passages is a lot to do with sort of drainage of, of these sort of courtyard spaces while, while they're being carved. Um, it, it, I guess to use the example of, of sort of a church uh, carved in a cliff in, in a rock face, in sort of a horizontal rock face. I think uh, previously what was, was sort of sort of commonly as, as assumed was that the craftsman would enter through what would become a window and then sort of carve the inside of the church and the outside simultaneously. What we found now with with um, some of the new churches is that they're actually entering through what will be the entrance and then using this, you know, carving in and using the, the rock as it, as it falls away, standing on that and working overhead, so kind of burrowing upwards rather than downwards. That that was that was sort of the point I was trying to make. I don't know if that it answers your question. Yeah, 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 it does. Uh, next question is from uh, Liam Philip. He asks, uh, he states first that a uh, very interesting session. Thank you, Taran. Uh, he asks, are you are the rock Hewan churches unique to Ethiopia or are they found in other countries in Africa? Um, so, yeah, it's uh, possibly should have said it. it's um, important to note that the well, rock uh, architecture is found throughout the, the ancient world so as far sort of east as China, um, I think, um, yeah, th there are rock churches in, in sort of Armenia, places like that, France, Italy. Um, in Africa itself, um, I, the, the, I don't think there's rock in churches in Egypt. There, there's definitely temples and, and sort of the sort of religious structures. Um, I think, yeah. So not, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> Rocky architecture is definitely very prevalent in the ancient world. I don't think there's anywhere else where there's, um, where it's a, a continued tradition, uh, as far as I know, um, in a sort of way. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Slingham. Uh, Chloe asks, uh, what do you think is the driving all these churches increased population or increased Christian population? I think you briefly mentioned there was a financial incentive for the craftsmanship. So is increasing wealth a part of it? Uh, I don't know. Again, sorry, I think I missed the first question. Um, yeah. So, yeah, she says, what do you think is driving all these new churches, increased population or increasing Christian population? Sure. I so think I mean, you briefly mentioned there was a financial incentive for the craftsmanship. So is increasing wealth a part of it? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Leigh. I think, um, I, I think the, the, sort of the, the primary reason is... Um, the, so the primary motivation is um, religious. Um, so I think I tried to convey that, that religion in, in Ethiopia or Christianity, at least in, in northern Ethiopia, is, is, is really, really dominant. It, sort of, it affects everyday life um, in sort of many, many, many aspects of life. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to people in Ethiopia, it, it's, sort of, it, it's sort of quite normal that you would be contributing money to, to a church, that's, that sort of thing. That, that's, and, and I don't think, no, I don't think people, um, I, you know, I don't think that it's got sort of a commercial aspect to it. I think it's, it's more sort of, um, yeah, purely spiritual, really. perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from Jessica. Uh, what is your opinion on a potential invasion by Western uh, tourist industry commercialization and impacts on local communities? Yeah, so I think that's a very good point. Um, I think, I don't, you know, for anyone who's been to La Libella, it's sort of, um, at least for me, there's kind of a, a bit of a conflict. It's an incredible place to visit, but I think the La Libella is a town and, and the site itself is sort of, I would say, very much been destroyed by tourism. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of the numbers that, so sort of in the 50s, you, you, you used to have to go there by, by mule, so sort of a seven day journey. In. It, it wasn't that sort of accessible to, to foreigners. I mean, now, you know, people might go to Ethiopia for two days and they'll fly up from Addis to go and see. If there's one thing people will see in Ethiopia, it'll be a church that I And it, it does mean that, yeah, that sort of, that the whole, um, the whole town in Ali it's not even, a, it's, 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 it's sprawled incredibly over the, even over the, sort of the last few years that I've been going there. But it does mean there's a, a very high dependence on um, tourism. And I think, I, I always worry about that, particularly, I mean, you can see in 
So the scenario right now is pandemic. Um, yeah, it's it, it's can be very problematic in in many ways. Um, okay. Uh, Matthew, you have, your question is a lot, so maybe if you could uh, turn on your mic and ask her directly, because you seem to be pointing at a lot of points, and I think it's best you address him straight on. But until then, I will uh, proceed to Greg, who is asking, is there any danger to the carvers from uh, rock falls during excavation? Um, potentially. Um... Uh, we, we haven't, so actually the, um, I guess, sort of health-related issues, one of them is sort of the dust um, from carving these spaces. So we, we have um, had reports of sort of, um, yeah, crops are getting very sick, um, just, just from breathing in this kind of dust. Also, depending on, on whether it's during the rainy season, they, they can become quite damp as well during construction, which, which is sort of, has, has that sort of health, health issue, but not... As far as we know, there haven't been any sort of, uh, accidents or fatalities um, from the carving itself. Okay. Um, so another question is from Danyacho. He asks, uh, thanks, Darren, very interesting presentation. Uh, the detailed drawings of the ongoing constructions I found very intriguing. How precise are they and were there modern instruments used to take the measurements? Yeah, so that's a, a good question. I, yeah. Um, so in 2015, I, I just used measuring tape. Um, and since then, I've, I've used a laser, which is you know, sort of slightly modern, but I would say it's still quite simple. And we, we have sort of talked about using, um, I guess, sort of more advanced technologies, like 3D scanners and that kind of thing. And I think personally, for, for me, it, it doesn't feel appropriate to these spaces, which are sort of hand carved in darkness without drawing sort of over, a, you know, sort of years, it, it feels, it doesn't feel appropriate to me to sort of go in there and, and do a kind of a 3D scan. So I've measured them all, um, I would say to quite a level of detail, um, but, but yeah, sort of using using a, a laser. So I would, uh, yeah, drop, drop the, the plan and sections of the building, or just, you know, just on paper, and then I'll normally have um, at least two or three different colors of pen um, to sort of uh, uh, take measurements for sort of say all the actual dimensions, so sort of like shafts and that sort of thing, but then also the dimensions between shafts as well as column heights and all that, all that sort of thing. So I would say they are, uh, yeah, fairly accurate. Okay, uh, we have Matthew here. So Matthew, if you could ask your questions directly. Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just, I was interested in what uh, you said about how this exhaustive documentation creates a kind of knowledge base about these churches that is not necessarily faithful to the way that they are remembered as part of a tradition locally. But I guess thinking about that and the slide you put up about the question of embodiment, um, where do you think the knowledge about and understanding of these churches really resides? Is it in, you know, the rock, something between the rock and the people who make them? Um, or is it in the culture? Because it's a very interesting phenomenon and I, I wonder how best to be faithful to it as a researcher. Mm. Yeah, Ma Matthew, um, nice to see you. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, I think that's, that's a big question and I, I don't know if I have sort of the uh, complete answer. Um, I, I think so. If you think of somewhere like Mali or, or something like that, where you've got sort of you know sort of the um, uh, the, the mosque at Jenna, where there's sort of a guild, a, herit a hereditary sort of guild of masons that uh, kind of pass down a, a kind of a technique, uh, technique or sort of information or ideas. In, in this case, due to the fact that there seems to be sort of a break at least, that there's not that at all. So when I talk about embodied knowledge, I, I sort of see that, I guess both, both the fact that religion is so dominant and, and present in Ethiopia, I, I see that as a major factor. But, but coupled with the fact, the fact that there are rocky churches, sort of, so people in, in Tigray, for example, there's, there's about 150 rocky churches. So it's not anything, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a normal thing if you've grown up there. It's, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it is, I think, largely part of Ethiopian of life and, and culture. I don't know if that's um, a jazz, yeah, it's a big one. 
Okay. Uh, Matthew, was your question answered <laughs> before you leave? Okay, so glad to hear that. Uh, other question, Taran, I have for you is in regards to the Dagmari Lalibela church you were talking about yeah. that is still going on excavation, as you mentioned, if I'm correct, right? Yes, um, so I don't know if that's a question. Is that the full question? Or? No, not yet. Uh, okay, uh, um, yes, so it is and it isn't. Um, uh, yeah, so there's already five churches. Is there more to it yet? Or are you just uh, looking into the five churches at the moment? So, so yeah, uh, I think maybe when it's really, I don't know if it, how clear it was, but it's a very interesting site um, and the craftsman is, is very interested. It's very um, sort of interesting. He's got, got a very sort of social and political agenda, um, but he's effectively trying to replicate Alibaba. So his idea is to carve 10 churches on site. And there is a, there's an old cave um, sort of just behind where the new churches are, which um, he claims um, was carved by Lali Bella as well, I think Lali Bella. Um, so effectively, he's going to have 11 churches, which um, it, it clearly sort of mirrors the complex at Lali Bella. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I've sort of been going there every year since 2015. Um, and maybe this relates a little bit to what we're talking about, sort of tourism and documentation. This site is, is it's... Um, it's close to Gishen and there's um, something called Test for Trekking, which um, is sort of, sort of an organization where I guess quite sort of out there tourists kind of go in and do sort of trekking um, around the area, but someone's sort of gotten on to that this, this, this site has been carved and in recent years there, there has been sort of an influx of, of um, foreign tourists, not, not many in comparison to sort of other sites. Uh, but actually also a lot of people from Addis, from Wadiya, from, from other places, you know, I've been there. I, th I think in 2015, I was by myself there uh, just sort of measuring and next thing about 50 school, stu uh, school students arrived <laughs> from Wadiya. Um, so sorry, I kind of got slightly off track, but I think to, to answer the first bit of the question, the, the, the intention is that there would be 10 churches. Um, so far there are five, which are, are more or less complete. But on our last trip, um, yeah, there seems to have been a fallout between the um, the priest and sort of the, the church community or, or the, the better connect. Um, so he actually was nowhere to be found and we, we don't actually know what the clear uh, sort of situation is, but people weren't very willing to, to, to sort of tell us what had happened. But there seems to have been a fallout between him and the, um, the church authorities in Moldia who, yeah. Okay. So yeah. aside from the fallout, how long do you think it will take to completely excavate the entire area? And yes, yeah, so, so he, uh, I mean, these churches, they, they're not as large as Lady Bella, they are smaller. And I guess it's important to note that the, um, the rock is quite soft. So it's almost, um, uh, it's almost like a clay deposit. It's, it's quite sort of uh, malleable. Um, he, he was sort of working um, with the help of two deacons. Um, he, they, they were carving a church a year, pretty much at that sort of rate. Um, so, yeah, I think if, if he was able to continue, he, he could um, uh, say within five years, probably complete um, his vision. Um, he, he, yeah, just to note, he, he has had quite a lot of coverage um, within Ethiopia. So when I was there last time, he was actually on EBC, EBC which is the, one of the local. Uh, yeah, I, I was in a restaurant and... Uh, it's an interview with him came up, so he has been quite well documented in um, yeah, sort of in Ethiopia. But I don't know if that's contributed to the reason that there's been some a sort of a fallout or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, like, you're conduct conducting various research. So, where what's your next step? Which sector is are you looking forward to continuing right yeah, now? So, yes, yeah, so I think. Um, I, mean, I mean, my journey with Ethiopia from sort of a research perspective, started with a dissertation um, in 2014, and that, that kind of led to applying for funding with, through, through the Adam Architecture Scholarship. And, and so one thing's kind of led to another, it's sort of, uh, part, of part of it's happened by chance in some ways. Um, I think I feel very uh, sort of connected with Ethiopia and uh, do see myself continuing to, uh, to, to sort of be involved in, 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 in similar projects. Um, yeah. I think it's very specific. I think in terms of sort of tying up this research, the idea, so, so a lot of this information is now online, but the idea would be to um, sort of uh, make some, some form of publication as well. Um, 
the sort of f further ahead, um, you know, I don't know, watch the space, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be sure to keep an eye out. I think Vinium has something to say. Go on, Vinium. Just a couple of remarks, maybe. Uh, first of all, um, thank you, Karen. It was really fascinating, especially to hear about the uh, new and ongoing uh, excavations. Mm -hmm. um, one thing uh, in terms of technicality, uh, one question I have is, do this craftsman It's, I mean, like we're in a time where architecture is like uh, really, uh, you have to draw something, you know, but yeah. um, so do these guys uh, prepare something in advance uh, what they want to achieve or do they craft that they go along? Uh, how yeah, does it yeah. yeah so, so no, it's a, it's a really good question. I think I was really surprised um, at the, at the Marina Lubella complex when I arrived there to, to learn that there were no drawings. <laughs> And, and um, I guess it's important again to reiterate, he's sort of guided by a vision, you know, he, he sort of had a vision. He, he sort of, yeah, I mean, he's effectively doing God's work, let's say, and and um, maybe doesn't actually know what, what's sort of happening. I think it's particularly with the sort of, sort of decorative carving, I think that sort of just kind of happens. But I think at no, I, yeah, I think out of the 40 sites, I think there's one site where we were shown sort of a rough kind of, um, you know, almost diagram of what, what they were sort of trying to do, but but often there's, there's no drawings at all. I guess in, in Tigray, where there are a lot of, um, you know, sort of precedent examples nearby, it, it's quite common that they'll say, we, we're carving a church similar to this church, or, or this is the motivation, so it's sort of, there's something to go by, but, but, um, but no, often there's no drawings, which again, you know, makes my role kind of interesting, like it's a sort of a whole inversion of, you know, these churches are made without any architectural drawings and then I'm going along afterwards. And can I, can I say one last little quick thing that I think possibly relates to Benium because I know he's, I think, got quite a keen interest in, in some materials. I think, uh, yeah, in terms of thinking about the right research, I mean, it's, it's probably interest, interesting to note that you know, thinking about sustainability, this is quite, a, quite an innovative sort of way of, you know, working with materials, the, the materials inside, there's no transportation. Uh, it's all these sorts of things as well. So just put that out there. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Vinny, you have something to add to that, or? Um, no, no, nothing really. I think uh, we really are running out of time. So uh, perhaps uh, maybe I'll just make a remark or reflection as to what I wish I would have heard more about in this talk. Um, uh, that is uh, perhaps uh, the soft aspect uh, of this, uh, the craftspeople, like their way of life and then like what they do. I mean, you mentioned, for instance, um, they work on this church uh, very sporadically due to funding and other contingencies. Uh, it would be interesting to work to, to know uh, if they are actually craftspeople uh, working on other things and like uh, also if it uh, talking to them, if it kind of hints into the genealogy of like how it happened, maybe explain this, what seemingly is like, um, I mean, not seemingly, practically a very uh, huge gap uh, from what, where it started and where this research uh, happens. So I, I think it would be very interesting to see um, this aspect, uh, should you continue with this uh, in the future? I, I guess that's, uh, um, what I want to just mention. Okay. I think on that note, we should wrap it up because we, we've passed our mark. It's uh, we've passed 10 minutes. I think I should wrap it up. That's okay with you, everyone. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Taran, again for this uh, enlightening presentation. I'm sure everybody found it very informative and entertaining. I'd also like to mention that we are having our next talk on the June 3rd by Rumi Okazaki titled Actualities of Historical Cities in Ethiopia. Registration link is available in our social media accounts. And just as a reminder, we have the link on the chat below to become a member or to support Intelau in any way or form you can. So be sure to check that out. And I think that's it for this talk today. Thank you, everyone. So have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.